Good afternoon. Welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda for this afternoon. CPSC staff will brief the Commission on the proposed rule safety standard for portable generators. The CPSC staff members briefing us today are Ms. Janet Beyer, mechanical engineer in the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction, and Ms. Barbara Little, attorney in the Office of General Counsel. At the conclusion of staff's briefing, we will turn to questions from the commissioners. We're now going to start with the staff briefing. Ms. Beyer. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, Chairman and Commissioners. As the Chairman just mentioned, today we will be briefing you on the draft NPR for portable generators. I will begin with the legal requirements and then turn it over to Janet to continue the briefing. This is a rulemaking under the CPSA. Section 7 of the CPSA authorizes the Commission to issue consumer product safety standards that consist of performance requirements and requirements for warnings or instructions. The requirements must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. Section 9 of the CPSA specifies the procedure the Commission must follow and findings the Commission must make to issue a consumer product safety standard under Section 7. Section 9 now provides that the Commission may initiate rulemaking through publication of an ANPR in the Federal Register. At the time of the publication of the portable generator ANPR, however, the ANPR was not optional but was required under Section 9A of the CPSA. The Commission published an ANPR in the Federal Register on December 12, 2006. Section 9 requires the Commission in issuing an NPR to identify the product and the risk of injury, summarize the regulatory alternatives considered by the Commission, present a preliminary regulatory analysis which includes the text of the proposed rule, respond to comments received on the ANPR, and invite comments from the public on the NPR. Section 9 also requires the Commission following publication of an NPR to give interested persons an opportunity for the oral presentation of data, views, or arguments, in addition to an opportunity to make written submissions. The Commission must make certain findings to issue a rule, a final rule. The Commission makes these findings preliminarily in the proposed rule. These findings include the degree and nature of the risk of injury the rule is designed to eliminate or reduce, the approximate number of consumer products subject to the rule, the need of the public for the product subject to the rule, and the probable effect the rule will have on the cost, availability, and utility of such products, and other means to achieve the objective of the rule while minimizing adverse effects on competition and manufacturing. The Commission al must also find that the rule is reasonably necessary to eliminate or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product, and that issuing the rule is in the public interest. Additionally, the Commission must find that the expected benefits of the rule bear a reasonable relationship to the rule's costs, and the rule imposes the least burdensome requirements that would adequately reduce the risk of injury. The Commission makes these findings on a preliminary basis in the NPR. In addition, if a voluntary standard addressing the risk of injury has been adopted and implemented, the Commission must find that the voluntary standard is not likely to eliminate or adequately reduce the risk of injury or that substantial compliance with the voluntary standard is unlikely. And once again, the Commission makes these findings on a preliminary basis in the NPR. I'll turn it over to Janet now to continue with the presentation. Thank you, Barbara. Good afternoon, Chairman and Commissioners. So we'll begin by answering the question, what is a portable generator? To put it simply, it is an engine-driven machine that converts fuel to electricity. It has a receptacle panel so that appliances and tools can be plugged directly into it or by use of extension cords. It is designed for portability, and for the portable generators we're talking about today, we mean generators that can be carried, pulled, or pushed by a single person. They can provide as little as a few hundred watts of power for the smallest generators to more than 15,000 watts for the largest. You'll see here pictures of generators that span the full size range with the smaller models on the top and the larger ones on the bottom. Their prices can vary quite substantially. 
depending on the size of the generator and its features. The primary fatal hazard associated with portable generators is carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide, commonly known as CO for its chemical name, is produced by the incomplete combustion of the fuel in the engine. Engines powering portable generators typically have very high CO emission rates. And to give you an example, a five kilowatt generator operating outdoors produces about the same amount of CO as 450 idling mid-sized cars. Furthermore, when a current generator is operated in an enclosed space, we have found that its CO emission rate nominally triples. In the nine-year period of 2004 to 2012, our databases have records of 659 CO poisoning deaths caused by portable generators, which averages to about 73 deaths per year. For the same period, we also estimate that there were more than 25,000 medically treated CO injuries. This is likely a conservative estimate because medical staff often fail to identify CO poisoning as being responsible for victim symptoms. 25% of the fatal incidents involve multiple, multiple fatalities, so these account for 44% of all the deaths. In fact, we have incidents where entire families were killed. In 2015, a father and his seven children were killed in a single incident along the eastern shore of Maryland when using a generator due to terminated service. In 2016, a couple and their four children in Michigan were killed in a single incident when using a generator due to a weather-related power outage. And most recently, in the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew, a nine-year-old boy in Daytona Beach died when a family brought a generator into the house due to loss of power. Last I heard, his father was in critical condition. And in Port St. Lucie County, in two separate incidents, one elderly couple died after running a generator in their garage, and another elderly couple was hospitalized. Also, there were 12 people from separate incidents in Charleston, South Carolina, who were non-fatally poisoned with various degrees of severity caused by generators. From our analysis of the incident data, we found that three quarters of all deaths occurred when generators were used at a fixed structure home. And this includes detached and attached homes, apartments, fixed mobile homes, and cabins used as permanent residences. 25% of the deaths occurred at other locations. For the 75% of the deaths that occurred at a fixed structure home, we found that 45% of the incidents involved a generator located in a living space inside the home, 25% had a generator in a basement or crawl space, 25% had a generator in an attached garage or enclosed carport, 3% had the generator outside, and 2% had the generator at home, but in an unknown location. We started bringing our concerns about the CO hazard with generators to stakeholders in 2002, when Underwriters Laboratories forms, formed a Standards Technical Panel, or STP, to develop the first U.S. voluntary standard dedicated to portable generators, UL 2201. We joined the STP at its inception and have been an active participant with a long record of advocating that the standard address the CO hazard through technical means. UL 2201 addresses safety requirements and tests related to electrical, fire, and mechanical hazard, hazards, but only addresses the CO hazard by way of incorporating CPSC's mandatory hazard labeling requirements. UL published the first edition of UL 2201 as a UL standard in 2009. We are not aware of any portable generators that have been certified to UL 2201. Nearly three years ago, in 2014, at staff's request, UL formed a task group to develop performance and test requirements to address the CO hazard that the STP could consider for adopting into UL 2201. The subgroup, the task group and subgroups have met 27 times to date, but have not developed a proposal of requirements for the STP to consider. We have also met with the Portable Generators Manufacturers Association, PGMA, on numerous occasions since they formed in 2010 and subsequently developed a standard dedicated to portable generators, G300, in 2014. Again, we have advocated that their standard address the CO hazard through technical requirements. 
G300 includes requirements and tests related to electrical, fire, and mechanical hazards, but like the UL standard, only addresses the CO hazard by referencing CPSC's mandatory hazard label. PGMA's G300 standard obtained ANSI recognition in 2015. We are not aware of any portable generators that have been certified to G300. The only other applicable voluntary standard we found is an international standard, ISO 8528-13. Although the standard is not specific to portable generators, some parts of it pertain to these products. However, it also addresses the CO hazard only through la labeling requirements. Because we believe that labeling requirements alone are not sufficient to address the risk, we have concluded that none of these voluntary, voluntary standards adequately address the CO hazard. We received comments on the ANPR and two other reports that staff released relative to our prototype development work, which I will discuss shortly. The comments covered a variety of topics and issues, but the primary ones were these. We received comments both in favor of and in opposition to shutoff concepts. We were asked to review the effectiveness of the label in reducing CO death since it was introduced in 2007. It was suggested that CO alarms are the solution to addressing not only CO deaths from portable generators, but all other CO producing products. We received comments that proof does not exist that reduced CO emissions will result in reduced deaths, and that reduced CO emissions will negatively impact generator cost, utility, availability, reliability, and durability. We looked at different ways that the CO hazard might possibly be mitigated. The first is CPSC's mandatory hazard label about the CO hazard. In 2007, CPSC adopted a mandatory CO hazard label that describes the hazard, its consequences, and the steps that consumers should take to avoid the hazard. While we believe the warning label is important, we do not think the label alone adequately addresses the hazard. So we also looked at several automatic generator shutoff concepts, but we did not find any to be technically feasible at this time due to a number of issues. And these include concerns about how a system could shut the generator off quickly enough without having negative impact on generator utility when used in proper locations, concerns about reliability in the myriad of fatal scenarios and weather conditions generators have been used, concerns about the environments that they are stored in between uses, and other concerns as well. We then looked at a CO emission rate reduction strategy which would reduce the hazard at its source. Based on our investigation into this strategy, we consider it the best, most feasible option. I will also add that the source reduction strategy in general has been found to be effective in reducing deaths and injuries elsewhere. For instance, a retrospective analysis of CO deaths involving automobiles showed that in the first 20 years after vehicles were required to have reduced emissions, CO deaths decreased by 81%. CO deaths caused by cars most often happen as a result of a car left idling in an attached garage. So when looking to address the CO hazard and to have a good measure of confidence that the CO emission rates from portable generators could be substantially lowered using proven existing emission control technology, we investigated the technical feasibility in multiple ways. First off, we contracted with the University of Alabama, or UA, to develop and durability test a prototype low CO emission portable generator. UA made the prototype by taking a commercially available generator and replacing the carburetor with an electronic fuel injection system, or EFI, tuning it to operate in closed loop and adding a catalyst. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we contract with the National Institute for Standards and Technology, or NIST, to test it in the common fatal scenario of the generator operating in an attached garage. I'll show you some of the results from that testing in the next couple of slides. We also considered the feasibility work that the EPA did to examine how other exhaust emissions, na namely hydrocarbons and oxides of nitrogen, could be, oh, could be lowered using open loop EFI and a catalyst, which also resulted in substantially lowered CO emission rates. And finally, we also tested three generators made by different manufacturers that have fuel injection and evaluated their emission rates. 
Also, I'm going to uh, just add one late addition to this slide that just about an hour or two ago, I received a press release from Kohler. Today, they announced that they are rolling out a new low, low emission engine that they say reduces CO emissions without sacrificing engine performance, which they say it is important for the health and safety of equipment operators. They are showcasing this at an industry expo in Louisville, Kentucky, and they just announced that today. This slide shows the test house on the NIST campus that was used in the generator testing. It's a double wide manufactured house with an attached garage shown here in the, on the right in this floor plan. The generators in both the un unmodified carbureted and prototype configurations were tested in the garage to compare the difference of the resulting CO concentrations in, that each produced in the garage and throughout the house. And here are the comparative results from one test of the test house configurations with the bay door fully closed and the connecting door between the garage and the house closed. This top solid green trace is the CO concentration in the garage over the course of the two and a quarter hour period that the generator was operating. The garage CO concentration reached over 21,000 ppm. At the end of that two and a quarter hours, the test operator shut off the generator and turned on an exhaust fan to vent the house and garage. And so the CO concentration dropped very quickly compared to how it would if we had allowed it to decay naturally. The dotted green trace uh, near the bottom is the CO concentration in the family room of the house. By the end of the two and a quarter hours of runtime, the CO concentration at that location was about 1800 ppm. In stark contrast, the prototype generator was run for six hours in the garage, and the garage CO concentration reached about 900 ppm, and the family room CO concentration reached a peak of about 145 ppm at the end of that six hours. The purpose of this slide is just to give you an example of how quickly a current generator can create an unsafe exposure and that it is possible to significantly reduce CO emission rates to levels that will significantly reduce the exposure and are expected to save lives. So we applied what we learned from all the evaluations I just mentioned previously by considering generators as fitting into one of these four different generator categories. These categories, which we call handheld, class one, class two single and cylinder, and class two twin cylinder, are largely based on the EPA's classifications of the different engine sizes, which the EPA distinguishes by engine displacement in cubic centimeters or cc's. But we also made an additional distinction of whether the largest of these engine classes, the class two engines, has just one cylinder or two cylinders up to a maximum engine power of 25 kilowatts. We looked at generators in these different categories so that we could take into consideration the different hazard patterns, costs, and technically feasible CO emission rates associated with each. This table presents what we believe to be technically feasible CO emission rates for the four generator categories when used outdoors, shown in the middle column, and the CO emission rates we assumed each category would increase to when used in enclosed space, shown in the right-hand column. We used the CO rates in the right-hand column in our benefits analysis to estimate the deaths that would have been averted by the draft proposed standard. And I'll talk more about that analysis in the next slides. But first I want to point out that the rates in this right-hand column are three times the rates shown in the middle column. As I mentioned earlier, the CO emission rate for current generators nominally triples when operated in enclosed space. So we are assuming that the same would happen for generators that meet the draft proposed standard. These rates are weighted rates, meaning that they are calculated from the emission rates when they are, that are measured when each of six particular loads are applied to the generator. So then, to assess the benefits that would be derived from these CO rates for each of the four generator categories, we contracted with NIST to perform modeling for us. The first step in that process was the selection of 40 different structures that best fit within reason many of the houses and garages in which fatal incidents occurred and which broadly represent where 76% of the deaths occurred. 
The other 24% of the deaths occurred with the generator operating inside structures that NIST did not have existing models for or were caused by the generator operating outside. In those 40 structures, NIST modeled the resulting CO distribution from a generator operating within it for 8 to 10 hours to simulate the runtime on a full tank of gas. This was done for both the estimated current estimated CO rates of current generators in each of the four categories, as well as the reduced CO emission rates in the range of those we estimated would be technically feasible. The 14 to 16, 16 hours after the 8 to 10 hour runtime were also modeled to complete a full 24 hour modeled period. NIST's modeling also used different generator locations and different seasonal weather data to have the modeled scenarios replicate the fatal incident data, data as much as reasonably possible. The second step in the process involved predicting the home's occupants' CO exposure profile, profiles that would result from the predicted CO distribution throughout the house. This was done using a physiological model to estimate the carboxyhemoglobin hemoglobin level, or COHB, for someone in each room of the house. COHB is a measure of the body's exposure to CO. We then took that modeling output and then the third step matched it to reflect the frequency of occurrence of those modeled scenarios in the incident data. Finally, in the fourth step, we estimated the number of deaths that could have been averted with generators if they had emitted the reduced CO rates. I'll explain this fourth step in a later slide. I'll add here, though, that we purposely used conservative estimates and assumptions in the modeling, such as occupants' air intake rates, generator CO emission rates when used in an enclosed space, generator run times, and other aspects, so that we would likely derive an underestimate of the benefits rather than risk overstating the benefits. Now, just to give you an example of the modeled CO distribution output, here are some results of the modeling for a mid-sized house on a winter day with a class one generator running in a garage that has a living space above it. The blue trace is the CO distribution resulting in the living room and garage from a current generator, and the lower yellow trace is that from one of the reduced CO emission rates that is in the range of what we think is technically feasible for this generator category when operated in an enclosed space. The hump in both traces is due to the generator running out of fuel after 10 hours of operation. Now to make estimates of the deaths for, for each CO rate that NIST modeled, we applied these four criteria to the modeled COHB output. In other words, these are the criteria we use to make a determination or assumption of death or survival. If the peak le level was below 40% COHB, we assumed that person survived. If the peak level was at or above 60% COHB, we assumed that person died. And if the peak was somewhere in between these two levels, then we took into account not only what the peak level was, but how long the person would have been exposed at that level to determine survival or death. And just as a quick example of this before I go on, referring back to that mid-sized house I spoke of a moment ago, these are the COHB levels that were calculated from the modeled CO distribution in the living room and the garage. Again, again the resulting uh, trace from a current class one generator is the top blue trace, and that resulting from the reduced CO rate is the lower trace. By comparing them, you can see that the occupant's peak COHB level is much lower and the amount of time it took to get to that peak level is increased. We then estimated the deaths averted by determining the difference between the number of known fatalities in cur involving current generator models versus those predicted based on reduced CO emission rates. In doing so, we assumed an equal probability of, of intervention over 24 hours. And we made this assumption because we don't have enough complete information to know exactly how long people were exposed, when they died, and when they were discovered. Furthermore, the high ratio of injuries to deaths in the incident data suggests that occupants often do leave the exposure or are removed by, uh, before death can occur. 
From our analysis and given our assumptions, we estimate that 208 out of the 503 deaths that were modeled could have been averted by generators that emitted CO rates based on the draft proposed standards limit for each category. Further, we expect an unquantified number of the 156 deaths from scenarios that were not modeled to also have been averted, especially since some of these involved the generator operating outdoors or inside large structures such as churches and apartment buildings. The benefits that we calculated then were, were then used as one of the inputs into staff's preliminary regulatory analysis. This analysis included an assessment of the portable generator market. In our market analysis, we identified about 80, ma about 80 manufacturers and importers of portable generators. We observed that sales fluctuate fairly significantly with major power outages. We estimate that annual shipments in re recent years ranged from 1.2 million to 1.6 million units. We estimate that there were more than 11 million units in use during the period considered by our benefits analysis, which again is from 2004 through 2012. And we also observed a recent trend in the market of increased sales of the smaller handheld and class one generators compared to earlier years. This last point is important because our hazard analysis indicates that smaller generators are more likely to be brought inside the home compared to larger generators which are often, most often used in attached garages. Two-thirds of residential CO fatalities occurred with the generator brought into the home. So an increase in smaller generator use might increase the incidence of people bringing the generator into the home, which is already the most deadly usage pattern. This slide summarizes the major findings of the preliminary regulatory analysis. The base analysis considers the estimated impact of reduced CO emissions on deaths and injuries in scenarios modeled by NIST, and it suggests substantial gross benefits for most generators. The estimated gross benefits per generator, shown in the first row, ranged from $214 to $254 for handheld Class 1 and single-cylinder Class 2 generators. However, the expected gross benefits for Class 2 cylinder generators are only about $4 per unit. The estimated cost of the draft proposed standard, shown in the second row, were generally similar across the generator types, ranging from $112 to $139. Given these findings, and with the exception of the Class II twin-cylinder models, estimated net benefits per generator, meaning the benefits minus the costs, would be about $122 for handheld generators, $136 for Class I generators, and $101 for Class II single-cylinder generators. Estimated net benefits were a negative of $135 for Class II twin-cylinder generators. Total costs, benefits, and net benefits were estimated by multiplying per unit estimates by the projected annual unit sales of each generator type. The aggregate estimated net benefits are $144.6 million annually. These net benefits do not include the unquantified additional benefits staff expects from the 156 deaths from scenarios that were not modeled. The preliminary regulatory analysis indicates that excluding Class II twin-cylinder generators from the draft proposed rule would increase aggregate net benefits to $153.2 million. The main findings of the base analysis were not altered by the results of our sensitivity analysis, which considered variations in products expected product life, discount rate, higher compliance costs, the value of statistical life applied, and the estimated effectiveness in reducing CO emissions for each generator category. For each variation that we analyzed, the overall estimated net benefits of the draft proposed standard were positive. And as with the base analysis, Class II twin cylinder generators were found to have estimated costs that were greater than the present value of the projected benefits. <clears throat> as part of our regulatory and oh, thank you. As part of our regulatory analyses, we also performed an initial regulatory flexibility analysis to assess the impact of the proposed rule on small businesses. We've identified 13 domestic manufacturers of portable generators, which could, would be considered small based on the size guidelines of the Small Business Administration. 
For nine of these firms, portable generators could comprise a significant part of their business. We've also identified 20 small importers of generators that could also be affected by the draft proposed rule. Small manufacturers could face higher compliance costs per unit if their fixed costs are spread over lower production volume and if they have to pay higher per unit costs for components that they purchase in lower quantities. Given all the analyses I just stepped through, we are recommending a proposed rule for portable generators that includes performance requirements and effective dates and compliance dates for four generator categories. A recommendation for the scope of the draft proposed rule is to apply these requirements to portable generators powered by small spark ignited engines and exclude portable generators that are utility types such as trailer and truck mounted generators and combined generator welding machines. We also recommend an anti-stockpiling provision that is intended to allow manufacturers to continue to meet market demand in the period between when the rule is promulgated and when manufacturers would have to comply without allowing too much of a surplus of non-complying generators after that period. And these are the performance requirements we recommend. The CO rates that are in this table are emission rates, again, that are calculated from CO emission rates emi emitted by a generator when operating in normal oxygen when each of six particular loads applied to the generator. These rates assume that manufacturers will have 50% manufacturing variation around the target production rate based on technical feasibility. For example, to meet a rate of 75 grams per hour, we think firms will set a manufacturing target rate of 50 grams per hour so that they can have as much as 25 grams per hour margin to account for production variation. Manufacturers can meet the proposed standard in any number of ways. It is a performance requirement and is not prescriptive. We are also not prescribing a particular test that manufacturers must follow to demonstrate compliance. We recommend this so as to lessen the burden on manufacturers. We have a list of options you could consider as alternatives to staff's recommendation. These include less stringent CO emission rates. Regarding this, when we looked at increasing the CO emission rates to levels that would reduce the cost, the benefits decreased greater than the decreased greater than the cost decreased. So increased CO emission rates actually resulted in decreased net benefits. Exempting the class two twin cylinder generators. We offer this as an option because as we already said, this category of generators has a negative net benefit. However, we recommend keeping them in the proposed rule because we are concerned about the possibility for creating a market for smaller twin cylinder generators. We would like to get comments on whether there is a real potential for that or not. Allowing the use of automatic shutoff systems as either a supplement to limits on the CO emission rate or as an alternative shutoff standard instead of reduced CO emission rates. We do not believe shutoff concepts are feasible at this time, but if we get comments that demonstrate otherwise, along with recommended requirements, we'll certainly consider that. Allowing later effective dates. Later effective dates and compliance dates would give more time for manufacturers to comply. We believe, however, that given the emission control technology we expect manufacturers would use to comply with the standard are already in the marketplace, we believe the dates we recommend are reasonable. Informational measures. The Commission could decide to take additional informational measures beyond what we're already doing, such as telephone hotlines or public interest broadcast announcements. However, staff believes that informational measures alone would not adequately address the risks presented by these products. Or the Commission could choose to take no action to establish a mandatory standard. In that case, manufacturers could market low CO emitting generators if they believe there would be a market for such products. However, generators with CO emission rates proposed by the draft standard probably would not be marketed in significant numbers voluntarily, at least in the short run. So now I'll close with staff's recommendations. CPSC staff recommends that the Commission publish an NPR as drafted by the Office of General Counsel to reduce CO poisoning deaths and injuries associated with portable generators. 
that includes specific performance requirements for the CO emission limits of four different generator categories. DAF recommends an effective date after of one year after publication of a final rule for manufacturers to comply with the requirements for class two single and twin cylinder generators. DAF recommends a compliance date of three years after publication of a final rule for manufacturers to comply with the requirements for handheld and class one generators. Thank you. We can now field any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Little. Thank you, Ms. Beyer. We'll now turn to questions from the Commission. It will be 10 minutes per Commissioner. I'm just going to start with a couple of comments. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of great packages since I've been at the Commission, but I don't think I've seen any package that better exem exemplifies the best of what this agency is and what it stands for. It's so well done. It's so thorough. It's so technically sound, from a layperson's perspective at least. It's so clearly written. It addresses such a critical issue, and it does it in such a thoughtful manner. And I know that while the two of you are here presenting, I can see you have everyone or many of the key members of the team have your back, with Mr. Hanway, Mr. Smith, Mr. Brookman, Mr. Natov, Dr. Inkster, and so many more who have worked on this. It's a really proud day for the agency. And I know in particular, Ms. Beyer, because you and I have had many discussions visiting many different manufacturers of how much you have put into this package and how much of your life you have given to it. So bravo for the work that was done. I think it's phenomenal. A couple of questions that I'll start out with, and I don't think I'll use my full round, but we'll see how it goes. You mentioned in the package four different auto shutoff technologies that the staff pursued. And I anticipate that one of the themes that we'll hear probably today and in the coming days and months is that even though we call this a performance standard, that it's actually very prescriptive because there are other potential technologies out there that staff, and I'm not saying I believe this, but I think we'll be told this, that staff is not accommodating in particular auto shutoff technology. So can you give us a, a fuller sense, please, as to what kind of work went into looking at those four different areas and why, at the end of the day, the staff did not feel comfortable recommending? With all the work that you've done and all the different things you've looked at, why did that not make the cut? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. If I could just take a moment, I really would like to acknowledge um, the team first because much of what you heard today is, was a phenomenal team effort, and I would like to. I know you rattled off almost all the names, but I don't think it was all. So it I wasn't, and, I, and <laughs> please use my time to So I'm sorry to cut into your time. No, I'll no, make no. It quick. This is the best use of my time <laughs> possible. Please go. Okay. So, of course, Barbara Little and General Counsel. We have Susan Bathalon, Matt Brookman, Steve Hanway, Matt Natov, Sandy Inkster, Charo Krishnan, Han Lim, Barbara Little, Chuck Smith, Tim Smith, Robert Squibb, Andrew Trotta, Troy Whitfield, and last but not least, but many, many field investigators who involved, uh, investigated these tragic incidents. Thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you for allowing me to say that. Okay, so to your question, yes, we did look at four um, different types of shutoff concepts um, that we uh, would automatically, the intent was to automatically shut off a generator before creating an unsafe exposure. And these included um, a, a global positioning system, mounted, mounted system on the generator to try and in, infer indoor operation uh, when it received, didn't receive signal um, from uh, the outside, from the satellites. Um, we also looked at um, CO sensors mounted on a generator to detect um, elevated CO emission um, concentrations around the generator. We also looked at um, a remote concept where there's a CO sensor located away from the generator. Um, ideally, the, cons the consumer would place that where it's appropriate within their house, so if there were det high levels detected in those locations, it would shut the generator off by way of a wireless communication to the generator. And lastly, we, um, as part of our contract with University of Alabama, we tasked them to try and develop um, a sensor-based algorithm that made sense of, made use of just the sensors that were part of the EFI system. And it, with each one of those, we had concern, different concerns, sometimes overlapping concerns, um, that, that amounted to um, 
negative impact on shutting the generator off when it is used in a proper location. We don't want to negatively impact the proper use of a generator. Um, tamper resistance, um, the, the, the concept of the remote CO sensor, first off, you're relying on the, the consumer to find the most appropriate place to put it, and he can easily choose to put it out the window if he thinks it's shutting the generator off without feeling any symptoms. Um, the ability to shut off quickly enough. Um, that was something we observed with the generator mounted CO sensing concept. We measured CO concentrations on the far side of the room that were 1,000 ppm before the sensor that was mounted on the generator actually shut it off. So um, we had a number of concerns like that, um, and so we, we pursued other paths. But at the same time, we also, in response to our ANPR, we did get comments um, from generator manufacturers who were also opposed to the, the shutoff concept. And we concurred with, with all their comments. Um, we, did get, we did get comments in favor of, and we considered all that as well in addressing those comments. So the team decided to move forward with reducing the CO emission rate because it does address the hazard at the source. And like I say, it's all, it is it's a proven strategy um, to help reduce, reduce the hazard. Is it, thank you for that. Is it fair to say as we consider the safety hierarchy where you first try to design out a hazard and if that doesn't work, you try to guard against it and if that doesn't work, you try to warn against it. In simple terms, is, the, is what staff proposed really at the top of that hierarchy where it's a design change and, yes. a, and a CO sensor or an auto shutoff, is that really more of a guard? That's correct. Okay, yes. So from a staff perspective, at least for addressing hazards, the staff approach is, is at the highest level of safety in terms of what you would pre prefer to see. Is that correct? That's correct. So and recently we're all aware of this. I think everyone, at least at the commission level, and I know that you've seen this too, that the Portable Generator Manufacturers Association, the, the standards body that has been working on this, or at least has, has the most of industry involved in it, has recently pledged that they are reopening the standard and that they are very aggressively moving toward their own CO reduction or, or their own way of measuring or meeting the issue. What do they know that we don't know in terms of auto shutoff technology because they believe that they that that's a viable path. Is there any technical information that we are not aware of that you think that they possess that would lead you to believe that there's a, that is a viable path? We have we haven't seen that. We um, we have not seen that. Um, they we did receive the same letter as you, um, and we did meet with the PGMA staff um, and representatives. Um, but they spoke of and included in their letter only broad generalities without any specifics really about what they're thinking to offer in the way of an alternative standard. So um, given that, that broad general framework, we do think that it would take a long time to evolve those generalities into clear concepts before you could even begin to develop requirements, performance and test requirements that we could then have to take time to evaluate, um, would take time to evaluate the effectiveness of those. So we haven't seen any data to, you know, or, or really anything beyond those broad generalities. Um, Got it. And fair to say that you'll continue to participate in PGMA and UL's voluntary standards efforts even while the rulemaking moves through the process if the commission were to approve the NPR? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like I say, we've been engaged since four years than I care to admit. Um, so we would not stop that. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Adler? Well, um, I think the chairman said it best, but I'm still going to try to add a few thoughts about the quality of this briefing package. Um, and waxing philosophical just for a second, this is an indication of government at its best. Um, we set up governments to protect citizens. I can't think of any higher calling for government than taking steps to protect uh, especially vulnerable consumers. Um, I've been following the Commission, as I'm sure everybody knows, for over 40 years. I cannot think of a better drafted package than I've seen here. This is the platinum standard for packages, and I, I hope everybody here knows how much we appreciate it, but not just us, consumers at large. And this is also an indication that 
Um, the free market can fail. We, we all appreciate, support, and advocate for free market approaches, but this is one where for a variety of reasons, without government involved, you would not have industry taking action, at least not in any sort of expeditious way. And on that very point, I wanted to go back to uh, the ANPR, which was published back in, was it December of 2006? So that's roughly 10 years ago. And when we publish an ANPR, we are directed in the ANPR to invite persons to submit a notice of an intention to submit or to draft a voluntary standard, a statement of intention to modify or develop a uh, voluntary consumer product sa safety standard. Now, it's been 10 years. Can you tell me, has anybody before this September letter from PGMA walked in and offered a statement of intention, a plan to develop a voluntary standard to address uh, the risks associated with this product? No, we have not. So what we have basically is uh, talk about a midnight submission. What we have is a midnight submission from the industry. I don't doubt their sincerity. But I do think this is a reflection of the fact that the free market doesn't always provide a response that we would need. And I would also make the observation that this is, a, to me, a classic hidden hazard. I remember when I had to go to Chicago to talk about the hazards of portable generators, and staff said something to me on the order of one generator produces uh, CO at rate, and I think they said of dozens of idling cars, and I took that out of the statement because I didn't believe it. I said, this can't be right. It can't be that these things are so hazardous that they actually would match uh, or equal so many cars idling, and now to hear 450 idling cars, it just tells us how little we all appreciate the hazards associated with this product. And the thing that's also chilling me is every time I read the news now and I see a storm coming, an ice storm, a snowstorm, a hurricane, I have trouble sleeping because I know people are going to die. And there's almost no way to reach out to them and say, please look at the warning label. Please really believe it. Please don't put it in your garage. Please move it outside. But we see even a small percentage, but a real percentage, of people who moved it outside the house structure and it still produced so much CO that it's caused fatalities. Um, and so uh, I guess uh, one thing that I did want to ask you to delve into a little bit more length, we have been working with uh, the industry through UL. Can you just give a rough, est rough estimate? Has it been that same 10-year period that we've been working with them? Uh, yes. I joined the, um, we joined the standards technical panel when they first formed it in 2002. Um, mm -hmm. And we we're, we're still um, involved in it. Um, the STP itself is not particularly active right now, but the task group that we asked UL to form to develop requirements to feed to the standards technical panel has been very active. Um, we sent that letter to UL in January of 2014. We kicked off uh, meetings. We, pr we do it all by teleconference meetings starting in May. And we've had 27 um, meetings to date. And can you tell me how many consumer groups or consumers were involved in the de development of the voluntary standard over this period of time? I'm guessing I, none. But yeah. I, um, we, we, as right. I said, we, what we do is uh, you all, and I'm not picking them out other than they're a convenient example. They try to give us balance, but what they do is they set up a category of user, producer, general interest. And then when you look at the people who are in the general interest, they are all retirees from the industry, they are consultants to the industry, they are expert witnesses for the industry, and dare I say they are professors, legitimately so, but who are uh, working for financial gain for the industry. The question is, are there any independent technical uh, in, is there any in independent technical input from consumers or consumer groups in this process? And my sense is, no. Yeah, I don't believe so, yes. Um, I guess the other question, this is just a pet peeve, and whenever the, I've talked to the portable generator manufacturers, and I've always asked this question, and I think I know the answer, but um, to your knowledge, no one who sells portable generators actually se includes a little cheap CO alarm when they sell the portable generator. 
Is that, that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, and this is one where I blame the lawyers in part because every time I've suggested it, they say the lawyers would kill us if we did that. <clears throat> Excuse me, but this is one of those situations where it seems to me, even if it wouldn't be a perfect solution, it might be some measure along the spectrum of safety that would reduce uh, deaths and injuries, but unfortunately we do have a lawyer-infested society of which I am a proud member. <laughs> uh, and I also want to commend you for putting in an anti-stockpiling provision. Uh, in previous standards, we've, we've not done that, and I think this is an, a truly important step forward because otherwise we're going to find, for years afterwards, legally sold uh, uh, inventory and that then undermines the ability to take steps towards safety. So again, I thank you and commend you for a job extremely well done. Mr. Robinson. I have been um, privileged in my very long career to work in a variety of environments where excellence has really been something that was uh, people strove for and achieved. I have never seen anything out of any of those environments that is any better than what you guys have put together. It just was outstanding. And I know that it's a huge team. You know, I'm one of those that's always complaining about the inertia of government. This is not one of those times. When you look at this package that was put together, it's just so impressive, so thoughtful, so clear. And I thank every single one of you who were involved in putting it together. It really helps us do our jobs so much better. Um, I was involved years ago in a case where I was representing Whirlpool in a furnace case that had caused um, a injury and death, a husband and wife. Um, and even though I was representing the manufacturer in that lawsuit, I became intimately familiar with the injuries that, uh, not just deaths, because that that's something we all understand, but I think that some, some do not understand the incredibly grave injuries. In this case, it was a woman who was going to have a normal life expectancy, but she was severely brain injured for her life from the carbon monoxide. So this is a problem that um, I'm so glad that we are, are addressing. And I have to say that in looking at your package, just I start with the incident data that you discussed. and. Um, I can't help but think that even those these numbers that are in your package are pretty astronomical, that they're pretty low, um, given the fact that there are, as you point out, so many instances of misdiagnosis because the, the symptoms mirror other, um, other illnesses and also the ones that are treated outside of emergency departments. And so um, I, these, these numbers are, are really impressive in, in the most serious way. Um, the, first time, the, the first time I met you, Ms. Beyer, was um, when I came out to the lab, and it was after, I, I can't honestly remember if it was just before or just after a visit from PGMA and other industry people who came in to talk to me about how we needed to do something about the labels. And I hadn't really focused on what the work was here at the agency um, until, until that time. And I have to say that I was really, I walked away so impressed with the passion with which you were going, you and your team were going after trying to get a better solution than, than just the labels. And um, I, I, uh, Chairman Kaye just brought up um, your, and you answered questions about the shutoff switch and why that wouldn't work. Um, Commissioner Adler um, said that, um, that, asked you whether you'd seen anything before the September letter that showed you the industry was trying to address the amount of CO admissions. I'm going back a little, a, a little more in depth than that just because of our conversation at the time of the visit. Could you just sort of describe for us the efforts that you have made, and I know it's been years, but the efforts that you and your team have made to try to get industry to do something to lower CO emissions from portable generators. Um, well, and and I will say at the outset, you know, we were um, just looking for CO mitigation strategies, you know, requirements. That's a much so, better phrase, right? Yes. <laughs> 
So that's what we were advocating for beyond the labeling requirements, a technical solution. Um, and we started having that conversation back in 2002. Um, so like I say, when we first joined the standards technical panel, and that's when the project first entered the CPSC operating plan, where we were um, monitoring these uh, deaths that were occurring in increasing numbers as the years went, you know, went on. Um, so we did bring it to UL's, and we had, you know, as uh, Commissioner Adler pointed out, we had well representation of our um, manufacturing community um, on the STP, um, hearing, hearing us bring this um, in repeated meetings to the standards technical panel at UL. Um, outside of that, in 2004, we held a public forum, and we invited many st stakeholders to attend um, to attend that meeting where we presented hazard patterns and hazard data that we had death data at that point in time. Um, so these are just some examples. We met with PGMA for the first time when they formed in 2010, um, and they formed to develop a safety standard, and we asked them to address the hazard. So that was back in 2010. And um, uh, like I say, three years ago, we've had active, you know, um, encouraging industry through our task group meetings with UL, same thing. We have uh, well representation um, and, contrib and, and a lot of contribution, good contribution from industry um, in those meetings. So that's been, it has been very helpful. Um, and PGMA hosted a um, technical summit in March of this year. So we um, presented at that and participated. Um, and then also, um, I traveled with uh, L, uh, Chairman um, back in 2013 when he was in the then Chairman Tenenbaum's office. Um, and he personally wanted to reach out to manufacturers to see if, um, if they were going to help, help us find a technical solution. And we found from some of those meetings that some of them are doing just that. So the, the, the information that you gave us in the package in ter terms of the technological developments that came through University of Alabama, through what we learned from NIST, as these things were going on, I assume we were informing industry of what we were finding out and what they might be able to do? Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, we voluntarily sol solicited comments after we completed our technology demonstration program with our prototype at UA and then at NIST. We put that on our website. We notified many stakeholders so we could get their feedback on that, and um, and we did. We got we got comments on that. So we've yeah we've we've really doubled down our efforts to um, keep the industry informed of, of, of our activities. And we've seen, um, and you just brought up Kohler, which I'm going to ask you a follow-up question on in a second, but we've seen industry, I certainly don't want to paint a broad brush w about industry, but in terms of the standards committees, um, what you just, you just said in response to Commissioner Adler's question that we haven't seen any indication that they wanted to do something with the standards such as you're advocating in this NPR today. Is that correct? Yes. Now, I, I know it's going to be more expensive to make these generators in a way that's safe. That's for sure. We all know that. And you've done a, your team has done an excellent job with the analysis on that. But have you seen any other, um, I was going to say legitimate, and that's a pejorative term, but have you seen any other basis other than the cost um, that industry has told you, I don't want to say industry, I'm sorry, that the standards committees have told you is a reason that they will not do something or haven't until um, expressing this desire a couple months, a few weeks ago? Why they won't do anything with respect to addressing CO emissions? Um, I uh, I think it's a number of things. Um, they've um, the, the the comments against it are we haven't we haven't proven that reducing emission rates will actually reduce deaths. We feel we have done um, the analysis to support that we do believe that it will save lives. So that's been one argument that you know that proof doesn't exist. Um, there have been some complaint um, some comments on the AMPR that. Um, we would negatively impact engine durability and reliability, um, but um, the analysis that we've we've looked at and um, 
others as well, does not bear that out to be the case. In fact, if you're looking for uh, applying fuel injection as a technology to meet the standard, that actually improves reliability and durability. There are many benefits associated with that particular emission control strategy to meet the standard. And, and manufacturers do um, uh, tout those benefits as part of um, advertising engines that have that emission control technology. If we proceed with this NPR, is there any reason that your work with the voluntary standards committees can't continue? Oh, no. We would, we would continue working with them, yes. Um, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question about the Kohler press release. I'm almost out of time for this round. But um, you said that it was a low CO engine that was available. Can, um, can, this, this, can this technology that they're talking about be used on all portable generators? They're, um, they're, they're advertising it as an engine, um, so it can go in multiple products. Um, and although Kohler is now in the portable generator market as well. Right. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, let me That's go back. That's because I asked the question poorly. <laughs> is it, well, this, can this engine go in all portable generators? Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's a single cylinder class two engine. Um, so it would nominally power a generator that's in the five to seven kilowatt range um, from what I read about it. And um, yeah, it would. Okay. And mm -hmm. just one more because I know my time's up. Um, do, do you know if the Kohler engine that they're advertising would meet the performance requirements in our NPR? I, I don't know that yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. My understanding from Commissioner Burkle, who's joining us by phone today, is that she would like for this round for Commissioner Mohorovic to go next. So, Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations uh, to the staff on this package. Um, like the rest of the Commission, I was waiting in great anticipation for this, and it absolutely did not disappoint. So, congratulations on all the work to the entire team, uh, and it was said much better uh, by my colleagues. I do have some specific questions that I'll do uh, my best. We've had a had a long day to get to. Um, the first have to do with handhelds in particular uh, with regards to utility. So with the, uh, in regards to the weight, now we acknowledge that the, the models with handheld engines uh, often are valued and promoted for their compactness and lightweight, and I've spent a lot of time reading a lot of customer reviews and a lot of websites, um, so I can personally confirm that, at least from what I've seen from my own study of consumer feedback. The package does talk about utility as it relates to EFI and the, market, the marketable benefits of EFI. And I think <clears throat> from, my, from my own um, uh, uh, perspective, I guess lay perspective, that with class ones and class two generators, I would imagine they could more reasonably carry increased weights without a utility loss. Uh, but the testimony suggests that there is an increased weight, and if the average weight might increase by 25 percent, with the handhelds in particular, knowing that they're handheld, so they're meant to be carried as opposed to on a dolly-like situation where um, what might be an incremental amount of weight on a much heavier unit might be uh, more impactful on a handheld. Uh, do you have any uh, comment on how increased weight for the reasonable ways that manufacturers might be able to m meet the uh, proposed performance standards outlined might impact utility specifically for handhelds? Right. <coughs> we've been, we've been, mi been mindful of that impact um, because there, is, there are additional components that have to go if, if they choose the EFI route for meeting the emission um, standard. Um, and so, oh my gosh, I'm, um, let me. Well, just general <laughs> utility yeah, on oh, the Oh, okay. The I know where I was going with this. Is um, it a different distinction with sorry, the difference? Or, <laughs> sorry, it's okay. I, 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 um, we do, we are, we are mindful of that, and that was one reason that we are suggesting a longer compliance date for the smaller oh, okay. generators because we, um, we expect that manufacturers, I mean, we're seeing largely um, this emission control technology coming into the marketplace on the larger engines, and so we figured they can use, they can leverage what they learn from applying it to the larger generators in that learning curve and then later apply it to the smaller generators. So that 25% weight that, um, that you just mentioned, that was discussed during one of the task group meetings. And I think that's largely, the, uh, a bulk of that weight comes from the battery. 
And so there has been look at battery-less EFI. And so I think that needs to mature more okay. and um, it would help address that concern. Thank you. Um, and also specifically with handhelds, uh, and I recognize uh, what you emphasized in the, in the uh, presentation with regards to the, their increased um, uh, market share or what we think is an increased market share, specifically with the smaller, and I think you mentioned handhelds as well, as uh, regards to also our concern that mm -hmm. there may be a greater propensity to bring that into, into the home, may, maybe even by just by virtue of looking at it because they're uh, mostly an enclosed um, uh, it's an enclosed product that just, quite frankly, doesn't look as dangerous as a running engine and with the um, open frame. So our proposed regulation aspires to reduce the deaths from foreseeable misuse around the dwellings. And though our staff says we can't quantify the safety benefits from the outdoor non-dwelling use, we do think that there are ancillary benefits to be achieved there too. Uh, but with the handhelds, in over 15 years, we've still only seen two incidents related to fatalities around and in the dwelling. Um, so I'm looking at the, uh, at the, st at the uh, mm, I should reference it specifically for our friends playing at home, tab L of the package. Uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the preliminary regulatory uh, uh, package, the uh, RIA. Anyway, there's table two that has the, uh, that has some of the uh, average engine displacements as well as the power ratings in watts. So bear with me with the hand held. And in table two, we identify that the average rated power wattage is, um, is 1,094 with a median of 1,050. And I'm not a mechanical engineer. But what I really wanted to spend time is to really understand whether or not is a handheld generator likely to be used in that scenario of a power outage to run the kind of units that are in and around the dwelling, as opposed to the campsite or mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the, the, the tailgate party where it's a TV and speakers, but, you know, AC units and refrigerators. So I went through countless testimonials uh, and got a bit, a bit of a education, whether or not it's the right education to have by reading that from consumers with regards to what the smaller rated products might be able to reasonably power. So I'm just wonder, trying to understand if it's really not fit for purpose for that usage, but, but would it really work in that scenario as that I understand that AC units and refrigerators, when they kick on, they have as much of a six times power surge. So if you could explain that dynamic in terms of what you think that a handheld at those averages might be able to power, and can we really see consumers wanting to use a handheld when they've got, um, uh, you know, critical uh, elements of their home they need to power? Sure. I, I would say that in an emergency situation, if there's a power outage at, at somebody's home and they have one of these handheld portable generators because of they take it tailgating or camping, recreational uses, they're going to use it. They may use it, and we've seen it in the incident data, to charge a cell phone. And so um, if they have it, they'll use whatever generator they have. And the thing about these smaller handhelds is they can also be um, connected in parallel. So you can, if you have yeah. multiple ones, you can actually up the, um, the voltage, um, the wattage um, to power larger appliances. Now, granted, yes, how many people are going to have multiple ones of those around? But people will use what they have if, they, if it is a, an emergency situation. Um, so they may not be able to, you know, keep their refrigerator running, but if they want to keep fire up their laptop and or charge their cell phone, um, they bring it inside and they do that. Um, the other thing with regards to the two fatalities, you're right. That the three, I think, but two incidents. Okay, that's right. Um, the thing to bear in mind with that is there was has a very low population of those handhelds in that benefits mm -hmm. analysis period. I think they um, covered a very small fraction, a much smaller fraction than the fraction of the fatalities associated with them. And that's why they do have a net positive uh, benefit associated <coughs> with them. And we, we do have concerns that if those become the more, particularly if they are excluded from the rule, that um, those will become very popular. And we we would expect to see not only more deaths, but more if they're excluded from the rule. Um, so that would be a real concern. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I think I'll have time for just one other set of questions around the, um, uh, the benefit, I guess, uh, directly towards the benefit side of the uh, benefit cost analysis and the premise of uh, the three times carbon monoxide emissions at low, C at low uh, oxygen levels. Uh, we have been provided data whereby at 17 percent oxygen, at what we recognize to be low O2, per while performing the six-stage test, um, a manufacturer has experienced actually lower CO emissions than normal at lower loads for carbureted engines, and then lower CO emissions at higher loads for a proposed EFI engine. So uh, I recognize that we're saying that the lower oxygen levels, we should be seeing three times the emissions of carbon monoxide. Why do you imagine in, in those tests uh, that we, we saw actually lower, lower COs, given those scenarios? Are you referring to data from our report or um, something? Data that was provided right. to the commission. Okay. Um, well, I know if I've gotten it, you've gotten it. But I don't, well, yeah. have you uh, have you done have you done that in running the uh, the six stage test test with either prototypes or carbureted engines and experienced uh, actually at some of those six stages lower CO or uh, I was just surprised to see that because it's it's um, thematic throughout the package uh, that right. at lower at lower oxygen we're going to see three times CO emission. Oh, I, I and see. What I, and I was uh, expecting to see that as they were showing output by stage, stage one, stage two, stage right. three. Right. So we, the factor of three that we're referring to is the, the calculated weighted rate. So it's not, we're not referring to the factor of three at any one of those individual six modes, six okay. loads. It's, it's the, um, um, you calculate the weighted rate across all six loads. I see. I can, I, I can help explain that maybe better offline. I think offline. that'll take an offline but it, it, uh, explanation, <laughs> but, uh, but I appreciate where, where that's going, because I have seen at some of the other stages yes. uh, significantly higher CO. So to be able to get a better appreciation for that uh, sure. will be something for later. So thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Burkle, I think we have you for one round. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and let me begin by echoing my colleagues' uh, really praise to uh, both of you and all of the staff that have been involved in putting this package together. It's a remarkable package and um, certainly the most complicated one I've seen. And I think uh, my colleagues agree with me that it's probably the most complicated one ever. Um, we thought that ROVs was a, was a difficult one, but <laughs> I think you uh, put together a remarkable package. And I thank you for all of your efforts and uh, all of the work that's gone into this. Um, this morning in the ops plan, we talked about um, lithium-ion batteries, and over the course of the last few months, we've talked about nanotechnology and recycled rubber and how various um, arms of the government are, are doing different things. And so uh, with regards to portable generators, I'd, I'd like to focus on another government agency, uh, the EPA, and just get some clarification with regards to what their jurisdiction is versus ours. I kind of uh, telegraphed this this morning in my closing statement, and um, so I just want to spend a little bit of time with this. And I'm not sure, this may be uh, Ms. Little's. Yes. <laughs> uh, this may be your. Um, so let me just begin. Um, with regards to the EPA, are they currently regulating carbon monoxide emissions from uh, portable generators? The EPA is focusing on uh, large scale ambient air pollution with regard to CO emissions, um, whereas in this draft proposed rule, EPSC staff is, in, intends to or is seeking to address the acute um, poisoning hazard to an individual consumer um, from carbon and monoxide emissions. EPA no. does regulate on a broad uh, national scale, and they have um, national air quality achievement standards that different regional areas across the country um, must meet in terms of CO emissions. But they're not regulating the from from portable generators that we're attempting or seeking to regulate today. Um, they're not regulating acute CO emissions from these generators. So they're only regulating the emissions from 
um, engines used in portable generators that are larger than what we're talking about today? Um, not, no, um, their, their, their focus is on the large scale sort of ambient air pollution um, in contrast to uh, the exposure to individual consumers. And if I could, I, I, you know, the section 31 of the CPSA, um, and I think this is maybe where your question is, is originating from, it, it provides that um, the com commission lacks authority to regulate a risk of injury associated with a consumer product if that risk could be eliminated or reduced to a sufficient extent through actions taken under a number of enumerated statutes, one of which is the um, Clean Air Act. Um, but the legislative history and the case law indicate that the CPSC is to consider all aspects of the risk as well as the remedial powers available to it and the agency administering the alternate, alternate statute and make a judgment of whether that statute can reduce the risk of injury to a sufficient extent. And the Commission has authority if there has not been sufficient reduction or elimination of the risk of injury. And here, you know, as I was mentioning, CPSC would be seeking to address a different risk of injury from CO emissions than EPA, and staff believes that this risk hasn't been sufficiently reduced. Um, you know, again, the EPA is focusing, and, the, and their regulations are, are sort of designed to address the large-scale ambient air pollution. Um, whereas ours are, are, would be seeking to address the localized risk to consumers from acute CO poisoning. And as, as Janet mentioned, um, there have been at least 751 generator uh, CO related fatalities between 2004 and 2014. So staff believes that, that the EPA regulations have not sufficiently reduced, I'm sorry, reduced the risk of injury to individual oh. consumers from CO poisoning. Um, okay. And we do address this in greater detail in our, our legal memo, and, and I'd be happy to discuss that with you separately. Good. And I just have a couple other questions along the same line. And um, as I mentioned, too, and I believe that the chairman is aware of this, but I can only stand for the, this first round of questioning, and, um, but I'll submit additional questions uh, for the record um, following the, the hearing or the briefing. Um, so just talking about EPA and their um, standards, do their existing CO standards that differ from what the staff is being, was proposing? They, they have a different emission rate. Um, I think Janet could better speak to that. Okay, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Burkle. So um, the EPA CO emission standards for these small spark ignited engines is 610 grams per kilowatt hour. So they, um, they have a s sliding scale, if you will, that scales with the, am the amount of grams per hour of CO that can be emitted as a function of the kilowatt rating, the max engine power of the engine. So that's 610 uh, grams per kilowatt hour. We're proposing a standard that is in grams per hour and it's product specific. The EPA standards are based on engine testing on a specific test platform. And ours is, what we are concerned about is ex consumer exposure to tailpipe emissions when that engine is operating in the generator. So um, that's a distinct difference because we, we don't care what the engine does when it's on a dynamometer. What we care about is when that engine is loaded in the, en in the generator. And I've heard, I've heard um, Commissioner Morovic, you're um, a little bit uh, about the prescriptive nature of our standard. And I'll just offer that um, it is a performance requirement that we are proposing. Manufacturers don't have to use EFI. That's how we chose to um, do our technology demonstration. That's how manufacturers who are working towards the same end as us are planning to meet the standard or are working towards meeting the standard. But because we have a standard that we're proposing that is with the engine in the product, we don't care what the emission rate is at max engine power on a dynamometer. And so 
manufacturers could choose to use current existing carbureted engines, an oversized engine for the current size generator they put it in, and they just have to design it such that it doesn't operate at those high CO loads. So um, they, they can meet the standard any number of ways. We went with a way that um, we think the technology is headed, but um, that, that is a fine distinction. I'm sorry, I'm straying away from your question, Commissioner Broco, but that is a fine distinction be between what the EPA does and we're doing. The EPA does not have product-specific emission rates. They just care about the engine, not the product it goes in. We're, we're looking at the product it goes in. Okay. Um, so I guess one of my concerns and why I mentioned some of the other issues that we're seeing being shared across government is making sure what we do or what they do doesn't affect or have some unintended consequence. And so if we're going to have a tighter CO emission standard like we're proposing in, in this NPR, how does that affect the ability to comply with the EPA regulation, limiting other pollutants that may, uh, that the EPA regulates, such as you know, hydrocarbons and, and the rest? That's, that's a very fair question and concern. And I will say that we, we went to great lengths in our durability and demonstration program to make sure we were not going to be looking at lowering CO emissions such that we would drive the engines out of compliance with EPA standards. And so um, uh, we've been cognizant of that all along. And in fact, um, our work as well as um, that of um, contributing industry members, as well as the EPA data that I mentioned before that we looked at, when you significantly lower CO emissions, you actually also lower the hydrocarbons and NOx. So you do have more of a benefit than, than what we're concerned about. And um, so uh, we are not, with our emissions um, re standard that we're proposing, is not going to drive engines out of compliance. In fact, they'll... Um, drive the HC plus NOx lower, which is what the EPA emission standards primarily care about. Okay. So just so I understand, so tightening up our CO uh, standard for emissions um, is not going to make it harder for others to comply with EPA standards at the same time? No, that's correct. Okay. Um, and I just have one other question. So I'm wondering um, if we uh, promulgate this standard, this uh, CPSC emission standard for carbon monoxide for portable, portable generators. How does that fit into? Does it preempt California and uh, or other state emission standards? I think that's something that we'd we'd better address um, at a separate date. And if okay, so is that required that we'd have a closed discussion on that? Or? I guess. Commissioner Burkle, I think uh, OGC staff can follow up with you directly in, in your office if that works for you. Okay, that's fine. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the consideration and going out of order and all of the accommodations for today. I, I thank you all very much. And Commissioner Burkle, do we have it right that uh, you'll not be joining us any longer and you'll submit questions, I think you said, for the record? Yes, unfortunately, I have to drop off here. I've got some responsibilities, but. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I will submit any additional questions for the record. Un understood. Well, uh, we wish you the best, and again, we continue to think about you and your mom. I, I so appreciate that. Thank you very much. So we'll go to the next round of questions. Uh, I'm going to pick up, I think, somewhere where Commissioner Morovic was with the smaller size, the handhelds in the Class 1. And one of the pieces in the package was that you do have staggered effective dates that you propose, and so... I'm curious to know your thoughts from a technological feasibility standpoint if you think that we could potentially bring that three-year date closer because even if today were the date that the Commission were to approve a final rule and it were three years out for those to comply, it seems to me that from what we've heard from some companies that they are moving that much more rapidly to be able to incorporate some type of compliant product probably through EFI and a catalyst to meet these emission requirements. And I do want to 
call out in particular three individuals, Lee Soul, Michael Gardner, and Mark Rowe from TTI and the work that they've done. They are PGMA members, TTI, but I think that they've played a tremendous leadership role in showing that this could be done. And I believe that it is feasible, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe it's feasible that we could potentially see compliance earlier than three years and if we build in, getting back to that this is an NPR, not a final rule, it's probably going to be another year or two before the commission is able to turn around a final rule and vote it out. That's potentially four or five years from today's date. Do you think it's technologically feasible that if the commission were to consider bringing that compliance date forward by a year, that that could be met without undue hardship? I think that's a, that's a reasonable possibility. Um, I do. Uh, I do know that, you know, the companies who've been working towards this end have started with the larger generators um, because it does seem to be a more um, natural fit and um, that's where you do see this technology applied to these engines in the marketplace. But I do think there is, um, there are rapid advances happening. Um, like I say, in the package there is already a handheld engine with, um, fuel injected, um, it's not for low CO, but it's a concrete cutter made by steel that has, so there's there's one engine in the marketplace already with handheld engine with that technology. So I would say that's a, that's a real possibility. And certainly, and this obviously we can get into later at the general counsel's office, but it seems to me that it's easier for us to have a tighter requirement on the effective date now in the NPR, and then if we get comments we can loosen that as opposed to trying to rein it in in a final rule. That's just me speculating. Nobody needs to comment. Uh, one of the issues that was brought up, and, and I don't know if this is still an issue when we traveled, and I don't want to name the company, but one of the companies talked about that they felt through the University of Alabama work that we would be requiring them to tune these too lean as close to stoke as possible and that from a functionality standpoint, that was not realistic. Do you, has that borne out? Do you feel like that's a requirement to meet the performance standard or can it be tuned more richly and can you deal with it either through the catalyst or in some other way to meet the performance requirement and as Commissioner Burkle mentioned, not have EPA issues as well? Yes, I do believe that, that there, there may be some engines that just cannot operate um, at at uh, the fuel control strategy needed to get the emissions lowest at the highest loads. There may be engines that due to their design that, that would be a challenge without doing engine design modification. Again, going back to what we care about is the emission rate when that engine is operating in the product is what matters to us. So if they can't operate at wide open throttle, which the engine should not be operating there in the product if, if the circuit breaker and the circuitry is operating properly, then you, you just have to take that into consideration in your integration, your engine integration strategy into the product so that it doesn't operate at those high, C, high CO, high fuel flow load points. So I think that's, um, that's a strategy to avoid, um, avoid that concern. But you don't feel like for somebody who has to, who, uh, for a performance standpoint, if it has to be tuned more richly, you do feel like that can still comply? That there's a, there are different strategies to comply with yes. the performance standard? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas in the package that talked about the staff seeking more information on is the oxygen level and, the, and whether it's at normal range or at 17%. Can you talk about why staff might be interested in 17%, what kind of data you're looking for, and ultimately why, how you would choose between the two of them as to which one you'd be more comfortable with? Well, first off, the reason the whole oxygen level comes into the picture is because when you operate, what we found from our testing with NIST when we did that house, uh, garage house testing that I spoke about earlier, we noticed that where the, where the generator is operating, it starts to deplete the oxygen um, in that space. It can, it's an air-breathing engine. It's consuming the oxygen faster than the space can replenish it. So the oxygen level starts to drop. And in that physical testing in the garage, we noticed that the oxygen did drop down for the carbureted units even as low as like 16% oxygen. For the prototype unit, the engine, I'm sorry, the garage oxygen level dropped 
somewhere in the 17% range. Then as part of that NIST testing to characterize what those emission rates were that were creating the CO distribution profiles, they ran um, emission testing that's entirely different than how the EPA does it with um, uh, running the um, generator in an enclosed single zone space and um, calculating an emission rate um, as, it's, as it's operating there. And in, in the course of that testing, we noticed that the emission rate, as soon as the oxygen starts to drop, the emission rate starts to climb. And it reaches a peak around 17% oxygen based on the testing that NIST did, as well as Matt Brookman did here in our combustion lab on separate um, generators. So we felt 17% is a, is a reasonable uh, oxygen level to expect in these incident scenarios to occur. So um, that's where the 17% came in. And, um, but what we also found with our um, prototype and prototype testing at NIST was that it originally, and a lot of the work with the NIST task, I'm um, sorry, the UL task group was focused on, it appeared that the prototype generator emission rate did not climb as the oxygen dropped. But the more we analyzed um, other data that we had on, on different generators that are in the marketplace now with fuel injection on them in closed loop, and we analyzed the modal data that Commissioner Morovic was talking about, we saw CO emission rate increase even on generators that were operating in closed loop. So it kind of um, rattled our philosophy that the emission rate would not climb for a closed loop fuel injected generator. The whole intent behind have originally trying to work with the task group to develop a test method for um, a low oxygen environment is because we wanted to make sure that if we have a performance standard for generators um, to meet to reduce deaths and injuries, and most of our deaths are incurring in reduced oxygen environments, we didn't want to have two different emission control te technologies that could meet it in normal oxygen and then you go and put it in an incident scenario and one of them, you know, has the CO flight as we were calling it in the task group and the other one doesn't. One's going to address the hazard and one's not. So that was the whole intent behind um, spending a lot of time in the UL task group to develop a reduced oxygen emission rate test. But the more we looked at the data, we couldn't really rationalize the, the burden for doing that, although uh, Matt Brookman did a wonderful job in streamlining that test process, but we felt we didn't really have the support needed to justify it. So we, we right now are proposing, and, and again, it's, we are proposing how we would test for compliance. We're not requiring manufacturers to do that. Um, but. Uh, if they wanted to do it, uh, it would just be a normal oxygen test. But if people come to different conclusions than what we have, we, we want to hear about that because we do want a standard that is going to address the hazard. That's, that's our primary goal. Okay, thank you. That was very helpful. And in my remaining time, I just want to ask from what you're seeing on the marketplace with EFI, do you see mostly closed loop? And I realize that they're not being put on the market for the purpose of reduced CO, there's other reasons why it's closed loop, fuel efficiency or something else, but are you seeing more open loop or more closed loop EFI engines, just as a matter of course? Well, it, it's hard to say because that's not usually a feature that they are going to advertise in the, um, that's not something that the typical consumer is going to understand what that feature is. So, um, and they may say closed loop, but it's only for certain, mm -hmm. certain mode points. Um, so it's, um, a little bit of a mixed bag. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Commissioner Adler. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm glad to hear the explanation that you gave to Commissioner Burkle about the uh, relative approach that EPA adopts versus what the staff is doing. Because when you're talking ambient air, you're talking about when I step outside and take a deep breath, what's the degree of CO in the air? And that comes from a variety of sources. But they're, they're really not looking at the acute hazard in closed spaces in people's homes. And even if they were, uh, they'd still have to convince us that they're addressing it to a sufficient extent. And I think 750 deaths is a pretty good indicator that it's not. But just on the, a broader level, we have 
have we not consulted with EPA? Have they ever voiced an objection to what the Commission is doing with respect to addressing CO from uh, portable generators? No, they have not. In fact, we, um, uh, they assisted us with the development um, early in the University of Alabama program. They actually helped us write the statement of work and evaluate um, the proposals that we got in. And after the contract was in place, they provided um, technical advice along the way and um, consulted with them a number of times. So they're no, they, they, they do well know um, what we've been doing and, you know, we have good communication um, throughout the development of the NPR package. Uh, which is yet another indication of how effective the staff has been and how comprehensive the approach staff has taken. I did want to talk a little bit about a point that Commissioner Robinson raised because it's something we've heard and we're going to hear again, and that is you're raising the cost of these uh, uh, generators. But one thing I want everybody to understand is these generators are imposing a societal cost now. Uh, by your calculation, if I read it correctly, it's $820 million, and that's from fatalities and non-fatal injuries. That's a societal cost that is being incurred now. And so what we're saying is some of those costs actually ought to be borne by the people who are making the product and profiting from it, and also from consumers who are getting the benefit of a safer product. So it's not as though uh, there aren't costs already, and when we're done with this, I'm guessing that those costs which are being externalized will now be appropriately, rationally internalized uh, with respect to the price of the product. So that's w point one. The, the second point I would make, and this is just the general observation, requires no response, and that is we've seen the costs at their highest just as a standard is developed. But, and this is a tribute to uh, manufacturers and industry, they're almost always clever enough, uh, especially when there's mass production, to come up with much cheaper ways of making the product. So although we, the staff properly and conservatively is estimating cost of these products, I would guess within a year even, you're going to see the price of these products drop dramatically. That's certainly been the c experience we've had with almost every product the Commission has regulated. Um, but I, I did have one question, and that is, uh, it's my understanding that EFI and catalysts have been around a fair amount of time, especially with respect to cars. Is this an expanding technology through uh, engines? Because I, I see that in ROVs uh, we're getting electronic fuel injection. Um, is, is this a technology that's well known and, uh, and I'm trying to think of the... Uh, one that even manufacturers who aren't using it would have access to fairly readily. Yes, absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess one other question is when we're talking about the efficiency of uh, a portable gas generator, would the technology that is likely to be adopted, would that have a negative, neutral, or positive effect in general on the efficiency of this product? Have a positive effect, yeah. They claim higher fuel efficiency. Um, so there are actual benefits, immediate tangible benefits other than not dying to consumers from purchasing these products. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Commissioner Robinson. I think I just have a couple questions. Um, in looking at the cost-benefit analysis that Commissioner Adler was obviously um, referencing a at some level, the, the um, I note that with the well, let me just ask it this way. The class two twin cylinder gener twin cell generators or twin cylinder generators, if we were to exclude those, what effect do you think that would have in the marketplace? Well, we do have a concern and we don't we don't know how real it is, but we do have a concern that we might see right now twin cylinder Class two engines powering generators are nominally rated nine kilowatts and higher. They're fairly large units. We have a concern that maybe we would start to see generators more down in the, in what we call the storm generator, which is in the five to six kilowatt. Um, you know, just in the smaller than below nine kilowatts than what we're seeing now, um, possibly coming on the marketplace with twin cylinder engines in them to avoid. Um, having to comply if twin cylinder 
class two engines were excluded from the rule. Because then they would be less expensive to purchase. Well, I don't, when we don't know that actually, I don't, okay. we don't, it may okay. not be that that's ad, an advantageous um, strategy to take. So we'd like to, we'd like to receive comments on that. Um, Commissioner Adler in the last round referred to um, uh, CO alarms and my reading of the package made me think that CO alarms were not the answer to this problem. Could you address that? CO alarms, we, we definitely, um, CPSC promotes and encourages um, use of CO alarms uh, to address any source of CO poisoning around the home. So we definitely agree on that point that CO alarms are important, but we, we think the most effective way to address the hazard, and I think this gets back to Chairman Kay's point, is design the hazard out of the product if you can do that. That's the first strategy. The, the CO alarm is the, is the backup if you, have, you know, if you have nothing else to do, you know, to address it. And I was looking at the um, tab A, page 76. You don't need to refer to it, but it just was talking about the incident data with respect to the analysis of CO alarm usage, and it sounded like it was the answer. Right, right. Okay. I guess um, I, I focused on that because it came along with the, as the only person on the commission who's at, who devoted her his or her life to practicing law in the courtroom, I take umbrage to uh, comments like lawyer infested. We don't dismiss all doctors because they're contributing to an opioid, opioid epidemic in the country, and I don't think we should dismiss all lawyers as being bad. So after, with that, I have nothing further. Thank you. Commissioner Marovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Robinson, as a former member of the testing industry, we were also um, much maligned for many, many years based on CPSIA imposed mandatory testing. Okay, sorry, I don't want to exhaust my uh, colleagues and staff's All patience. All of our burdens today. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one question. All right, this year in, Ma in March, we uh, actually, April, we at the CPSC passed a retrospective review plan. And in Article 5 of that retrospective review plan, one of my favorites at the agency, it speaks to uh, providing for retrospective review provisions in new rulemakings, ex ante retrospective review. That is, in consideration of future rulemakings, we'll conceive in the front end how we're going to measure the effectiveness down the road, what will be those metrics incorporated. So I will note that we passed this on April Fool's Day, so I hope the answer isn't the joke's on me in terms of whether or not I should or should not have expected to see a retrospective review plan in the rule. Can you can describe whether or not the team considered it, rejected it, or, if, uh, or why there isn't a retrospective review plan in this uh, new rule pursuant to uh, the Commission's wishes? I'm not sure we're prepared to speak to that. Not sure if it's appropriately well, we voted. directed. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we've us. got a proposed rule in front of us. We have a plan. The commission voted 5-0, saying in new prospective rulemakings, we're going to embed retrospective review as a matter of policy for new reviews, and it doesn't exist. So um, that, I guess, there's no answer why that doesn't exist. Not okay, at the moment. No answer. All right, I, I've stumped you with that. I apologize. Uh, maybe on uh, more mundane matters, uh, the cost-benefit analysis. So uh, I, I you might need one of your experts for this, Ms. Beyer, but if you can field them, uh, then let's have at it. Uh, with regards to the, the cost in tab L of the preliminary regulatory analysis, we recognize that um, some manufacturers that we discussed suggested our uh, preliminary direct costs were, um, were understated. And we've, I've heard personally uh, in this meantime that they might be in, in, in fact as much as double what uh, we have identified as direct, direct costs. Uh, did we use the EPA estimates or in fact did we reach out directly to component uh, manufacturers themselves to understand and get uh, an identification for the direct costs that we incorporated in the BCS? Yes, Commissioner. We did uh, use EPA estimates. We um, but we also reached out to firms this summer as part of an effort with a contractor 
uh, economics analysis staff participated in interviews with manufacturers uh, trying to get their, their estimates of costs of these components. And um, uh, in general, they, they ranged quite widely from the four firms that provided information. Um, but I'd say that uh, probably in, uh, at least two of the manufacturers for the individual components that we provided cost estimates for, they were sort of in the same ballpark as ours. Oh, so okay. that gave us some confidence that, uh, that our estimates uh, were still reasonable. Um, I'd say that the, the EPA estimates, they're a result of extensive analysis and research and, and widely reviewed. And uh, because it appears that the costs in, to the industry haven't changed all that much since the EPA estimates were uh, provided, and we've also taken steps to update those costs based on producer price index that we think is, is appropriate for this product. So. Ideally, we would have more recent estimates to base our, our analysis on, but we think that with the adjustments we've made that are, uh, are and the information we've considered by the provided by the firms, that our preliminary cost estimates are reasonable are and supportable. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And I recognize also you have a sensitivity analysis in here as well. Yes, uh, yes. In general, the, uh, the firms that did provide information um, somewhat provided somewhat overall higher costs than we have estimated. And I'm sorry, so, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we'll have notice and comment too. So those that now yeah, that yeah, these are out in the street are be our able sensitivity to get, analysis did these guys are gonna get real annoyed with me if I don't start moving on okay, if you don't okay. mind. Okay. We did account for a fifty percent increase in cost. I do I do recognize that. One of the other assumptions uh, or one of the um, uh, the presumptions that were made to us from manufacturers was that there would be a disproportionate cost impact on handhelds and the smallers versus the larger engines to incorporate EFI uh, as well as the catalyst because of the, um, the, the reasonable um, limitations with, regard, with regards to size and weight. Yet I recognize in our preliminary analysis the costs uh, don't reflect that. Uh, do we just not agree with that point of view that um, or are we surprised that uh, they're actually lower cost to incorporate the same technology in smaller units with um, a reduced housing and geography to work with? I think we would benefit from more specific information on the handhelds. It's a very small part of the market right now. And uh, although it is growing somewhat, it's still only about 1% of the market in recent years' sales. And, but we do recognize that there are some features of, of those generators that create problems, additional problems for incorporating these features in them, so. Okay. Uh, Ms. Beyer, um, uh, this is a specific question with regards to, um, well, I've got a couple with uh, the potential for loss consumer surplus uh, per unit. And it gets to a point that you were making, I think, with the chairman, and I'm not a mechanical expert or a mechanical engineer, but I recognize in the program stated objectives that we sought out a prototype that would, quote, uh, not negatively impact the engine's power, output, durability, maintainability, fuel economy, and risk of fire and burn. Um, yet, I noticed in the, in the package there are several places where we would expect that generators, in order to perform at the proposed uh, performance elements would need to run at stoichiometric. Um, and I was, I could only partially understand some of the dialogue you had with, uh, with uh, Chairman Kay, but is, do in fact we expect that to, uh, to achieve the performance outputs that we're recommending, that engines would need to run at stoichiometric? And if so, how would that, or would that impact any of the stated objectives, you know, with durability or um, uh, power or anything? With, um, with the fuel injection, um, operate if closed loop, you're talking about stoichiometric fuel control. That's where stoichiometry is where you obtain your lowest CO emission rate um, in the spectrum of, of air to fuel ratio. Um, so it doesn't, um, our findings are that it doesn't impact power, it improves fuel economy, um, and 
again, we, we were acknowledging that maybe not all engines, um, uh, not all engines are built the same. So some engines may not be able to be modified enough in design, either in the combustion chamber or the, or the valve seats, to tolerate operation at stoichiometric. Again, if you can, if if you can have um, have the engine operate in the generator around those load points where you need the fuel enrichment um, due to concerns about engine durability and temperatures, then you just need to take that into account as you integrate that engine into the generator. Okay. Uh, under the same um, idea of the objectives provided, um, some have indicated a lack of power, a loss of power as a re result of achieving the performance elements for lower CO as identified in the package. Uh, do you agree with that? And if so, uh, from the uh, economist's point of view, should that have been incorporated into lost consumer surplus per unit if, in fact, uh, these new performance elements will, uh, will, will result in a loss of power by the units? Well, I'll address the first part of that. Please, I don't, I don't think we've heard that. Um, we haven't heard that specific concern from the manufacturers, or at least I'm not recalling it at the moment. I can go back and, and check. I know on our prototype, we um, achieved nominally. It was uh, slightly less than the max engine power when it was in the carbureted configuration, mm. but um, it was it was um, very close to what it had been. And I we, we haven't heard that from the manufacturers who've been um, okay. We've got a lot of proprietary stuff. I know you have too, yeah. so that's what, uh, forgive me for the lack of transparency, uh, but we'll be able to discuss that offline. But from the economist's point of view, if it was in fact determined that there was a loss of power, we would incorporate that logically into lost consumer surplus? I'd say we'd make an effort to do that. Yes, make an effort. I'm not sure if we'd have adequate information to make, uh, to monetize that. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I'm going to go ahead and yield, if you'd like, my 10 minutes to you since you're on a roll. Thank you. I'll go as fast as I can. Sure. Thank you for your, for your patience. Um, I have another question. Uh, we talked about the increased weight of the handhelds and uh, what might be a 25 percent increase weight. Would that also be something uh, with regards to the cost analysis that can be analyzed as impacting lost consumer surplus? Uh, and factored into the benefit cost analysis for for the handhelds in in particular, could that be monetized? Uh, I have my doubts that it could be to tell you the truth, but we could at least make reference to it in the final analysis. I would hope we might I mean if you think of it's a handheld product and the you know it's meant to be carried and carried yeah. by one's hand and if they just can't make it to their tailgate party or out to the campsite from car camping right. out and to the tent. That, as, as Janet mentioned earlier, I think during this process of uh, adjusting to this regulation, should it become a regulation, I think there could be features that will become available that would mitigate those problems for the smaller generators, ah. such, such as the, uh, the batteryless EFI technology that's, that's being used in some products, such as uh, that would not add, add additional weight to the product to that would reduce the, the amount of additional weight that right. that would and the reduction of no re resulting without a carburetor as well I imagine too okay um, thank you now we um, uh, Mr. Smith we talked a little bit about price elasticity um, privately in advance of the of the meeting and, and I recognize that um, especially with the handhelds uh, many are marketing these as for recreational use and that's the main marketability of these particular products and I do recognize in our preliminary benefit cost analysis, we used um, a surrogate uh, by using household appliances with the assumption that we'll have uh, inelasticity with regards to price demand for the product. That's based on, I think, the, uh, the assumption that these products are being used generally across all generators uh, for um, uh, a power outage situation, but for the handhelds where the marketing is somewhat distinctly different with regards to not DIY projects, not construction purposes, but specifically for camping and recreational usages. Um, would you recommend a price elasticity figure uh, that, is more, um, that is more properly associated with recreational use products as opposed to the other? Because it was broken down by class, and I'm just questioning whether or not there should be uh, greater elasticity uh, 
uh, to price uh, for the handhelds versus uh, the other particular classes of generators. At this point, I'd, I'd say that it's possible that given the different nature of the smaller generators that their use patterns might involve different price elasticities. And you might, might say that they might be more elastic than, than we've assumed for generators as a whole. And uh, as a result of that, if we increase the price elasticity, that would result in a uh, greater reduction in, in purchases. Thank you. Uh, relatively to the, relative to the increase in prices, so we could uh, attempt to account for that. Thank you very in much. The future. And on the few, on the other side of the ledger, uh, Chairman, can I continue? I've yielded my ten minutes to you. So you're oh, thank you. You're good uh, to go. Uh, with regards to the potential for increased consumer surplus per unit, um, with fuel efficiency, we've heard that the fuel efficiency savings is a recognized benefit for the commercial users with heavy use rates, and some have claimed that they're, recoup they're recouping the incremental cost of EFI within maybe as little as one year of use. So I understand that monetizing the benefit of electronic starting and other soft consumer use benefits is difficult, but with an estimated 11-year product life cycle, um, I wonder why we can't monetize the increased consumer surplus from increased fuel economy. I think we, we might be able to do that if we have more information about usage patterns. Uh, although the products might last 11 years on average, um, if consumers purchase them for power outages and the like, it might be that they might not get much use over the course of a couple of years. They might. So in terms of fuel efficiency, might be 20 percent greater efficiency. Um, uh, we need more information on, on usage to calculate what that might be over the course of the life of the product. If the Commission does move forward, perhaps you might want to consider uh, asking or soliciting increased questions in terms sure. of Sure. We've identified that as an ancillary benefit, but I right. think it's something we should But it might be monetize. monetized and perhaps we're not, we're undervaluing the benefits by not really being able to look at the reduced cost to the consumer by using a more fuel efficient uh, generator. I'd agree with that. Thank you. Um, and, and the last point, the last one, I've read uh, many reviews where the consumer value the noise produced by the generator. Now it does, and this may be for Janet first, uh, excuse me, Ms. Byers first, does the EFI and catalyst increase or suppress noise? I think the noise is mostly related to the muffler um, that you use, um, primarily the engine noise. Um, and um, I can't say, I, I really can't, can't say whether or not that. it creates a noisier yeah. or a less noise. Oh, very yeah. well then. Fine. Um, I understand. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, the last question I have is with regards to generator location. So, Ms. Byer, we recognize that 25 percent of the 565 deaths that occurred at a fixed structure home occurred when the generator was in the attached garage or the enclosed carport. Now, when a generator is located in a garage, do we know how often the garage door was found open or partially open or, or closed? I understand our models and the rationale behind those models, but um, that's a pretty big sample there, 25% of 565. Should have been paying closer attention around the uh, 140 mark or so. Uh, do, we, do we know that? I think I could defer to Matt Natov here, but my recollection is it's not frequently reported. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. Not it's, not very, it's not reported. Not frequently reported. Okay, yeah. very well. Then uh, that does it for me. Oh, so um, they're saying that it's it's frequently it is a fully closed door when it, when that information is available. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding to my colleagues. Hope I didn't exhaust your patience. I have no further questions, Commissioner Adler. No further questions. Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Mohorovic, anything else? Great. Having no having heard no further questions, this concludes this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Thank you.